Hey, I'm glad you could join us for this uh, 20th episode of Mages and Sages Interview with the Old Mage. Our special author guest today is Matt Forbeck. Matt Forbeck has worked on several D&D uh, supplements back in the heyday of Dungeons and Dragons when Forgotten Realms was first being introduced as the second edition replacement to Greyhawk. We also have a special fan guest, uh, Spike Murphy Rose, who has been a big contributor to our podcast over the last year, and we welcome him. This is the first hour of the interview with Matt, and we hope you enjoy it. We a lot of fun doing this, a lot of laughing, a lot of reminiscing, and I uh, just had a general good time. So enjoy this uh, first hour of the episode with Matt Forbeck and the Old Mage. Okay, I want to welcome everybody back to Mages and Sages interview with the old mage. This is episode 20 with special guest Matt Forbeck. Matt, how are you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you here. Now, I want to go through some of your lengthy, lengthy, <laughs> lengthy <laughs> credits when it comes to, to your, your writing. Now, I have the three here. I'm not sure if you've done more than this for just for the Forgotten Realms. We have Unapproachable East, uh, Sages and Specialists, and I know the, the Demonology book. And what else have you done for being like the Forgotten Realms for the game itself? Oh, geez. Um, I did. I wrote part of Races of Faroon. I wrote part of the Unapproachable East. I actually wrote most of them, Unapproachable East. I'd have to look over my bookshelf to see more. I mean, it depends what you want to qualify as Forgotten Realms. Like, Dungeonology is set in the Forgotten Realms. All of the Endless Quest books I've written are set in the Forgotten Realms. Uh, I've done lots of other D&D supplements as well, like, uh, you know, Sages and Specialists and the Stronghold Builder's Guidebook and a bunch of other ones that are D&D stuff that came out when the Forgotten Realms was and still is the main setting. So those kind of half-ass qualify, I guess. Um, no, that's no, that's 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 what I was. That's actually what I was, I I was talking about. Uh, I also now, written stuff for Eberron and for Dark Sun and things like that. Right, you've done Halo, you've done Assassin's Creed. Yep. correct. Um, well, I, I, worked, done, I was a story doctor in Assassin's Creed uh, Origins. Really? Yeah. Oh, so I, they just wait. brought me and said, "Here's the script. How, you know, give us the thousand foot view and tell us how things if things are screwed up, where the plot holes are, and stuff like that." So, right. Thank you for that. They had other people <laughs> working for years. I worked at it for like three weeks. So. I, I only take a tiny bit of credit. You know, I'm just there polishing. Now you should take all the credit for it. Actually, yeah. and, and since we heard that voice in the background, let me give you a roll call. Who's here today? We have Curry Russell, myself, Jeff Thetford, of course, Matt Forbeck, Ed Greenwood. We have uh, Eric Boyd, and special guest sitting in with us today is Spike Murphy in the place of playing playing the role of George Crashos. <laughs> <laughs> Those are this is where you start speaking in an Australian <laughs> accent. Yeah. That's, that's right, that's Spike. You need to start talking in an Australian accent, okay? Just say stuff like, hey, put a shrimp on the bobby, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> So I want to welcome everybody, and actually it's Spike Murphy Rose. He is married now. Women, you got to stay away from him. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you too, Curry. And uh, yeah, and also saw in here you did the uh, the junior novel Star Wars Rogue One. How was that? That was a lot of fun. I actually got to fly out to Lucasfilm and read the script for the movie about nine months ahead of time, and then they gave me script access too with, with this uh, app on my computer or another app on my phone that would give me a password that was good for sixty seconds. And I would <laughs> sign for the app on my computer. And if I left the computer for more than two minutes, it would shut down and I'd have to do it all over again. Um, they were very tight on security, but it was a lot of fun. It was neat. I got to fly out there and meet a lot of the people, uh, the other writers that were involved at a writer's summit, which included Gary Widow, who uh, wrote one of the early drafts in the screenplay as well. It was a kick and a half. I really Oh, that's that. incredible. How this... do you write a young adult novel where everyone dies at the end? <laughs> <laughs> Looks for kids. After. Every time I write a book for a kid, I'm like, oh, this is too dark. And they're always like, no, give us more. Like, <laughs> There's flaming headed zombies. There are people getting murdered left and right. No, the kids dig that shit. So, you know, they they do nowadays. The the realities of life from Star Wars. <laughs> can can you imagine one of these books being published back in the 1950s? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated at Hollywood's uh, embrace of technology for that sign-in, the phone and the... Yeah. Because back, back in the old days, they used to FedEx you a CD-ROM, which you put into your computer, and it gave you an access, and then you had to break the CD-ROM into pieces, put it back <laughs> in the envelope, and, send it and back. FedEx <laughs> it back to them to prove that you... <laughs> Well, it's oh, funny. I, I have a similar thing for work. When I, I work at home, uh, now it's going to be two days a week. 
where I have to sign in, but it's a special sign-in, so that I can't just access it. I have to sign on to a, it's called a Duo app, and you just, you have to, it, it generates a random code that transmits mm -hmm. to my to my laptop, and then I sign in, and then it's good for a minute, like you said. Yep. And then after that, if I don't sign in, then I have to get another number and then sign in again. So, yeah, that's, that is so cool. So, I mean, I remember that's what, that's what Bob did when he went out and did uh, uh, his uh, Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, he did, when he did the, the Kill, yeah. Killing Chewbacca novel. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Killing <laughs> Vector Prime, yeah. Oh, I like the, the fan <laughs> favorite. I like that the way one. you put that. You didn't, you, you didn't put down Vector Prime. You said, oh, it's the Killing Chewbacca novel. That's all you really need to do. That is awesome. Oh, my God. That's probably why he's never written another one, too. So well, we just dashed all the hopes of Bob coming on the show. Now. Thanks. <laughs> no, no. No, it, no, no. Because we, we talked about it before, and I, I did an interview with him after he wrote Vector Prime, and he said that he thought he had a thick skin for his writing until he wrote that book. <laughs> No, there's some really passionate fans out there. Believe me, it's kind of nuts. And did yeah. they? And did they slaughter him too? But uh, I, I have the book and I enjoyed the book. So uh, I do it. I did miss Chewbacca, but I also missed uh, Blackstaff and <laughs> half the people. But in the your realm. aim is getting better. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, so let me go back to your your plethora of Captain America, Blood and Thunder, oh. uh, boy here, uh, Blood Bowl. Yeah, I wrote four Blood Bowl novels and a mini series of comic books. That was fun. Is that fun? Oh, what, what, what's that? Is that what is that about? I mean, uh, book Blood Bowl is a uh, tabletop board game that was designed by Games Workshop back in the eighties, and it's Amazing. a uh, um, it's fantasy football, but instead of the kind of you don't normally think about, it's elves and dwarves and vampires and uh, whatever trying to kill each other on the football field, right? So it's <laughs> hyper violent, tongue in cheek. Uh, the players drink killer genuine draft and Bloodweiser and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. games like the, the Bad Bay Hackers and uh, oh the Orphan Raiders and shit like that. So they're, it's very they're fun. It's network fun. contracts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like they. Yeah, it's 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 sports, but with way more overt violence. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, they're not so much worried about the traumatic brain injury right there. It's it's well, because really the not to walk off the field. So. <laughs> The scene has an advantage. <laughs> oh my god! And and then I'm not sure if this is a complete list. I mean, I'm on I'm on four back. Uh, four no, back. that's that's uh, that's like the last ten years or so, maybe a little bit further. Okay. Maybe nine years. No. And it looks uh, like you did some. Is that steampunk? Show wait, shotguns and sorcery. Shotguns and Sorcery was a fantasy series I did on my own for that 12 for 12 thing I did, uh, which was where I tried to write a dozen novels in the year in 2012. But Shotguns and Sorcery was originally a D&D &D setting that I had sold to Mongoose in third edition times, but then my wife got pregnant with quadruplets, and that all went yeah. south. God, and we decided, <laughs> we decided to call it a miss at that point. Uh, and Robin Laws asked me for a short story for an anthology I was working on. I wrote it up, and then I kept writing stories about it. So uh, we actually have a role-playing game that was funded. I think it's way overdue right now, but it's finally shipping to backers uh, as we speak. Um, U.S. backers have already got it. International backers are getting it this month and next month. Uh, and then we're going to release it later in the year. So we'll actually have a, a tabletop role-playing game. It's based on Monty Cook's Cypher system. Oh, really? oh, okay. So, um, so it should be good. Rob Schwab did the rules. The guy did Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, amongst many other great books. And uh, I wrote the background and all that kind of stuff for it. So it's been a, a kick and a half. Now I'm looking at these shotgun and sorcery. Are these, are these graphic? Are these graphic novels or are these? No, uh, they're, they're books, like with you know stories and everything. So. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I've been working on doing the ebook for the omnibus just today, even so, I got my head way into this at the moment. Oh wow! Okay, I'm sorry, it's Eric. You're basically say fantasy noir stuff, right? You're in this place called Dragon City, where uh, the elves live on the top and the orcs live on the bottom, and they're surrounded by a wall that keeps the undead from killing everybody. And that wall was put up while the dragon emperor slaughtered all the orcs or the undead around the area for long enough for them to get the wall up and it now is worshipped as, as the dragon emperor throughout the entire area so uh, it's nice little it was idea for a role playing game because you could just plop it into any spare section you had where it right. said don't go here there's undead or there's dragons or whatever mm -hmm. and then you got this uh, wonderful little fantasy noir city that comes out of it. I love how that emphasizes the, the class stratification uh, in <laughs> there we're going to add to element it 
Exactly. Yeah, because that's one of those things that I, I really love about uh, Shadowrun, for instance, as a setting, was that they added in those politics of the interactions between races that you didn't find in D&D for a long time because they right. wanted to give you mindless enemies that you didn't feel guilty about killing. Most people have heard my rant at some point or another about how all orcs on Faerun are descended from slaves. Uh, they are. They are. Are you and you and Brian? You and Brian Cortia must be must be loving each other. <laughs> oh, I I know. I, I sent him a rant about this after I heard the first interview. Uh, but yeah, yeah, because they are like they came yeah. in two different two different instances. Orcs were kidnapped from other worlds and enslaved, just like the Mulan people, the the Mulharat, or ancient Egyptians and Sumerians. And uh, uh, started the, the Orcate Wars, and uh, one of the five creator races brought them in uh, as well. But that's where all the orcs came from. The only other orcs I remember were the Thay has created races. Eric uh, is and, attempting to insert a uh, correction here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not convinced that the first, first group of orcs actually were enslaved. I actually think they chased the elves back. After the elves stumbled through a uh, a gate to other worlds, basically, I think there's a world of orcs, which is where the, the the gray orcs came from. But the mountain orcs, I think, actually were from like a different continent on that world. And I think when the elves went through around negative twenty four thousand, the orcs chased them back, and they came into the spine of the world. And then they kind of like hung out there, and they kept getting eaten by the dragons, so they didn't do anything except the occasional attack on elves. But it was only when the dwarves built them all those really nice houses, that's when they started getting big. Yeah, but that's I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought it was one of the the rival creator races. Here uh, we that go. It, that Down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Here we go. I thought there was hey, a Matt, it was on, nice on, to on, meet you. We'll yeah. see you on the next show. You guys are done. I'm going to take a nap. That, that, <laughs> that, the orcs coming in to basically mess up everything with the elves. Like, to, con, either convince the elves it was a good idea or made the portal open there. But I, I'll have to look for a citation. I'll, yep, yep. I'll call Brian. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of stuff to share with you, Spike. Around there's a. There, I'm gonna stop in a second, Jeff. I promise. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go right ahead. <laughs> but way up there against the spine of the world, it's only on the map in FR5, the Savage Frontier. Is a very strangely named dungeon called Gate with a black yes. cube floating in oh, it. Oh yes. And. That black cube, if you get in there, there's a beholder, and he's um, there's it might be bugbears, it might be some uh, boogans, those are the quaggoth orc hybrids. But mm -hmm. basically, they're guarding this floating black cube in the middle of a cavern. And if you get inside the black cube, there's all these different multicolored doors, and each one leads to a different world. And it was built by the Bayatef, which are you know part of the creator races. Yeah. But I think that's how the orcs got through into this world chasing the elves who were dumb enough to explore it. That would make a lot of sense. I have uh, I have a group I'm running through. I'm having them explore Marantide from one of Ed's old online articles. One of the things that their orc play, half orc What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> that will lead to the orc home world. And because the symbol for Luthic is the word is the symbol for home in orcish, I figured it would probably be that because orcish is normally in Deathic but that symbol is not a deathic symbol, which means that it has to be one of the remnants from the orc language that carried <laughs> over from their home world. So it would make sense the symbol for Luthic is their symbol for literally for home, for their home world. So if we're going to go with Stargate logic here, obviously that's what that's the keystone you need to get back to the orc home world. And that's why we can't have any witnesses in this country. <laughs> <laughs> so mad. <laughs> No, no, it's wonderful. No, I've had this heated conversation with uh, Brian before. So, uh, <laughs> just a couple other things I wanted to ask you about, and then and then we can uh, hit into some questions here. Um, Curry's just looking, going, hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Looking at just the cover of Rage Two, it, it, it almost looks like a Tank Girl type mo model. Yeah, uh, it's, it's nothing like that, but I can see why you get that. It's kind of it, that was a video game that I worked. I wrote most of the cutscenes for Avalanche Studios. Um, yeah. Sweet. They brought me out there for a couple weeks. And, uh, and I worked with them remotely as well. 
Well, that's a sequel to a game called Rage that came out from id Software back in the late 80s, early 90s. I think it was... Mm-hmm. That was well, no, 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 no. That was way, it was way, way more recent. Uh, Rage came out in the 10s. I, I okay, played there you go. Uh, it, it was a fantastic <laughs> game. Uh, uh, it felt... It, Story and it uh, fell short, but the graphics it was cutting edge. Oh, they had the John Pippen game. as one of the voice actors. What else? Do you yeah, need? yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't nearly as exciting this time. Well, we had a lot of good people working with us, but um, and it was fun. I, I basically they brought me in to help break down the story so that it made some kind of sense, and then to help write the cutscenes for that. They had a team of people doing dialogue for all the different people because it's this open world game as well. It's an open world first person shooter essentially set in a post apocalyptic area. And these are the same guys who did the Mad Max video game right. and also do Just Cause and a bunch of other fantastic games too. So uh, it was a lot of fun to work with them. They're, and man, I tell you, these guys, I've known these guys for like 25 years now, I think, something like that. But I actually came out and worked with Avalanche Studios in a game like 20 years ago that never came out, right? And like so many video games get uh, lined up, you line up people, you work on it for a year or two. And then they kill it before it's even announced. And nobody oh, yeah. ever hears it. But probably about half the games I've ever worked on. Uh, really? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, it's one thing. Because I'm just a freelancer who comes in and helps with the story. For the other people, it's like, I've spent three years of my life on that, and nobody gets to ever hear about it, right? Oh, yeah. Man, on the other hand, they get a paycheck and benefits and all that kind of stuff. So you can't whine too much about it. But, I mean, all the reason you do stuff like this is that you get to show it to people at the end and say, right. isn't that right? And they never get to have that experience. I know people who've worked, you know, 10 years in the video game industry have never had anything shipped, right? Wow, it's right. Kind right. of painful. Well, I worked I worked four years on a novel for, for Wizards that's sitting on my shelf. Ah, oh, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I feel that's like there's... That's nothing, Jeff. There's room for a dwarf protagonist now. I think I think it's been paid. What you got to pitch it. You got to say like, think about this. Like everyone loved Tyrion Lannister. You, you know, you, you've had you've had the Hobbit movies, which, eh, but you know they made money. How uh, dare you? <laughs> I, I, I think you're missing the target market, Jeff. Just say it's like Frozen, but with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Nicely done, Eric. Nicely done. Billions. Billions. I'm frozen, damn it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Let I'm going to... <laughs> and, and that way, yeah, they're talking about a, a war hammer at that point. Let it go. Let it go! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to read a quote, because this. I'm going to have to read this, uh, this book here, uh, Matt, because just from the covers. Wonderful. Uh, Hell comes to the high seas as James Cameron's Titanic crashes full force into the iceberg that is Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> yeah. It's from Carpathia. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is. So I didn't write that quote. But there you go. <laughs> no, that's Chuck Windig. <laughs> uh, no, there you go. Chuck's a good guy, right? Yeah. Uh, he blurred the book for me. That Tell was me uh, book. That, w- that actually wasn't even my idea for the novel. My publisher <laughs> that idea. He's like, man, I got this idea. It needs to be done in time for the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking. I know you can write it in that time. Go. Here's the idea. Run. I, he says, you have to sell it to my to the rest of the team, but I'm the publisher, so I think it's probably going to go. <laughs> <laughs> the, idea, the funny part is he had noticed that the, the ship that picks up the victims of the Titanic is named the Carpathia in right. real life, right? And Carpathia also happens to be the name of the mountain chain from wh- in which sits Castle. Yeah. So. Yeah. From there, it becomes fairly easy to say, well, obviously, they were on their way back to the old country to return some vampires back home, when suddenly this disaster happened, and now it's all gone south. So did, did they turn the shipwrecked survivors into <laughs> into uh, vampires and then let them loose on the United States? Well, it doesn't quite even get that far. I think the entire thing burns out and goes up in flames before they reach the oh. coast. <laughs> oh, no. Not to spoil it for you, but there you <laughs> Well, it's damn it, so I, don't, I don't have to read it now. Thanks. I, I, thought that was, I thought that was a ridiculous idea at first, but then once you made the Carpathia like uh, connection, I was like, oh, yeah, no, that totally makes sense, of course. Of course. Oh, yeah, that works. works. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go by the thinnest of excuses, yes. Now, now, Jeff and Curry, if you yeah. ever need an idea for another show, the <laughs> number of things in gaming that come down to, we need you to write this in, like, a day. Two days, three days, whatever. We know you can do it. And we've got this piece of cover art that is totally inappropriate. And (laughs) we need it to be 16 pages long. And um, I'd like a synopsis on my desk in 20 minutes. Right. 
You mean like she was you know. taking down the nude son to die or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> have, have just gotten published for the first time and working on a couple of Kickstarters. It's definitely, yeah, like that was a, a surprise. when the <laughs> Seeing how much of that is going on behind the curtain. We, we funded the Kickstarter how long ago? And there's been no work on the manuscript for how long? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The there due date is when? <laughs> Last week? <laughs> it's all duct tape and bailing wire at the end of the day. You know? No, don't say duct tape, because that's how Ed used to send his CDs to Jeff Grubb, remember? Oh. <laughs> no, no, never duct tape. Glass filament tape. That's oh. right. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have a contest to see who could break it open when they put it out? <laughs> no, no, they, the new hire, they would just take the package to the new hire and say, um... I got to meet with someone with Bruce Hurd in the games library or something like that. Kirk Colonel Mustard with a candlestick. Um, could you just open this for me? <laughs> and then they'd hand it to them, and then everybody would drift over from their cubes and then arrange seating so they could look <laughs> over the walls <laughs> as the cursing started. That's awesome. But, but that wasn't me being nasty to TSR. <laughs> that was Steve Winter at Mecca at a Milwaukee-era Gen Con, doing a seminar on how to submit to TSR, <laughs> right. and holding, holding up an 8-inch floppy that someone had stapled to their manuscript <laughs> printout, oh, oh, and nice. mailed in the U.S. Postal Service, who folded the whole thing, <laughs> as a submission for a dungeon to run at Gen Con in nice. two weeks. Oh, oh. <laughs> And he said, never do this. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's and that, a lot of things that never do there. <laughs> and, and, and I happened to work in a public library at that time. And one of my jobs was sending the mail out. So we had our own Pitney Bowes meter that we ran everything through. And we also had the job of opening the mailbags of the stuff that had come to the library. And they delivered these heavy canvas Her Majesty's Mail bags into a six-inch deep puddle of water that was permanently at our loading dock. So I knew that any mail I sent to TSR had to be submerged and survived. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, Spike, you had you had some questions you were firing off earlier. Let's go ahead well, and go with those. before that, Curry wanted to say something, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. right, Curry. I'm sorry. That whole introduction was for you. That's right. <laughs> so... Just a, a brief moment of hero worship, if you gentlemen will indulge me. Matt, one of your first publications that I recall from back in the gaming days before I was big into the novels was uh, Sages and Specialists. I yeah. love that. We can talk more about that in a bit. It was it was really um, a great part of my gaming career from the earliest uh, of, of what I can remember. So That's thank awesome. you for coming on the show. Super happy that you're here. Spike. Buddy, listen, here's the truth about you. You're one of our biggest and longtime contributors. And honestly, without your questions, my position in the podcast truly would be irrelevant. I would have nothing <laughs> to add. I'd have nothing to throw out there if I wasn't this schlub. Oh, read this uh, question from Spike Murphy. Because there's always, you know, a thousand of them. And they're always just so well thought. So I want to thank you for all the time and the effort that you've put into the content of our show. So thank you so much for being here. I super appreciate you being on board with us tonight. Oh, it, yeah. I'm, You're here. Yeah. I'm just happy to get to ask these questions because I've been wanting... These are things that have been bugging me for like 20 or 30 years. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, I can hear that, the Matt? For you tonight, for sure. <laughs> right, yeah. I can remember reading for stages and specialists back in like junior high and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, a lot of like... You know, there's a lot of things that I know more about uh, world history and world cultures from D&D &D and from all those second edition splat books and Dragon Magazine articles than I ever learned in school. And, yeah. you know, I got my, my uh, high school diploma when I was 16 and started going to college right afterwards. And I still never learned as much in any school history course as I did reading through the Complete Paladins handbook and learning all about the Templars. Uh, and then getting into arguments with my mom about it because her astrology class told her some bullshit, like, you know, they were mystics mumbo-jumbo or something. I don't know. You know, or, or learning about different, uh, one of my, uh, 100 vampires from around the world in, in one of the 90s Dragon magazines, which educated me about all kinds of different uh, world cultures and their interpretations of the undead and different types of vampires and stuff. 
and it's stuff I still go back and use, and it's it's just awesome to get to ask people like Ed or Matt uh, or Eric, who I love picking Eric's brain. We could talk about so many things for so long. <laughs> Speaking of it's Eric, an Eric I, banquet. I appreciate uh, all of your time and dedication to the show, Eric. You've been with us almost oh, every yes, single sir. episode since the beginning, and I want you to know how much that has meant to not only myself but Jeff. The oh, idea absolutely. that you're willing to come and hang out with us lowly mortals it's it is really a special opportunity for me to get to do this when we do the sessions it means a lot to me ed and jeff this is where i'd like to congratulate the both of you i don't know if you guys are aware of it but this show represents our first year of doing oh, the that's right podcast. so i wanted to say ed wow jeff thank you for bringing this content to people like me and to the fans and getting everybody involved in a way that people can just reach out and touch you guys with their questions and be involved and keep their passions of their gaming and their reading Hi, only alive. Um, it, is, <laughs> Hi, it has only been a true love to get the opportunity to participate uh, in all of this with you guys. I started gaming with Jeff at 11 years old. I still have my very first character and to return the favor uh, of what I was introduced to about Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I introduced Jeff to the novel line when I was 18 years old, and we've been off on this adventure nonstop together yeah, that's right. ever since. It's been uh, a really important part of the bedrock of our, our relationship, and I have a lot of that to thank from pretty much everybody I can see on my screen right now, and I want to thank you very much for everybody being here for our one year anniversary show so i just needed to say that i, I really appreciate it guys Ooh, congratulations yeah well, thank you i didn't oh, yeah, you know, I didn't even realize it wow well thank you curry that is incredible yeah. well ed a year <laughs> yeah and, and guys if i ran the universe everybody in this call would get to write all the forgotten realms novels they want there, there you yeah. go full on novels <laughs> full on novels about anything they want Oh yeah! Oh orcs. yeah! We could always do or, no, no, oh, except orcs. Except orcs. Come on! Oh come on! I, I can see, I can see Spike doing a great job on the joy of orc sex. <laughs> I mean yes, but will it get published? <laughs> yeah, but what would you call? You can't call the Kama Sutra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 uh, yeah, I'd have to redevelop the orc language from that old uh, Dragon magazine. There you I go, have, Spike. Uh, that's your that's your job. <laughs> I, you know, I have a so, whole. So, I, so, if George was on here, he would tell you he does have a lexicon for yes, the orc language. Oh, that's right. He <laughs> does. Oh he my does. God, because I do. I have the old. Uh, so I have all every language lexicon that was ever published in Dragon or any other supplement I could find from D and D in one. Oh, we've been working on all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is so a when whole you... elven, yeah. dwarvish, lust, yep. Illuskian. I didn't even know George wrote an Illuskian one, but he wrote an yeah. Illuskian one. Yeah, like George sent me his dwarven one, and I'm out. So I'm Spike, impressive. when you write Fifty Shades of Grey Orc. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey Orc. I'm lying. That would be, is, is that a chat book? Ed, Ed said we could write any books we wanted. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. I'm expecting New York Times bestsellers, guys. Oh. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. 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 For sure. So that'll be what the orc, the elf, in the lingerie wardrobe. <laughs> mm, I can see this conversation going south in a hurry. <laughs> Just the thing so <laughs> to spend so time bad. with that. <laughs> the poor guy is sitting there going, "What is he? What have I? Well, what so, just saw?" So 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 Matt, tell us about young adult books. Wait, so Matt, what we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna put a big block over your face so nobody knows it's you. <laughs> so you know. Well, <laughs> The races of Beirut, uh, you know, we've been seeing a lot of races coming back into uh, 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 into play again with 5th edition, and there's a lot more emphasis on playing things besides just like humans and elves now. One of the things that I've seen a lot of folks calling for now is 
uh, separating some of the racial like stat bonuses, for instance, like just from the race, having them be more culturally associated or regionally associated. Is that something you guys were thinking about when you wrote Races of Faerun, or was that a consideration back then? I didn't have any say in it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I was a freelancer, so I forget, it was a Rich Baker was in charge back in those days, I think? And, uh, that sounds correct. right. Yep. Yeah, the way it used to be is they would come up with a page plan for the book, and then they would say, we need somebody to write this section. And Rich would say, Matt, Matt can write A through X or whatever, and, you know, and he would just give me the ones either through some criteria in his head was either one part of the alphabet or the ones Rich didn't want to do or the ones somebody else didn't want to do or whatever. And I would take them and go. You know? So uh, I don't really know the philosophy behind it other than that. I'm sorry to disappoint you on that count, but oh, I, no. so it was mostly like, oh, that sounds cool. They've done this before. We need to do it for third edition. Go. You know? Yeah, well, and that's, I mean, like, I, we referenced earlier um, how there used to be like gender differences in stat bonuses uh, oh, yeah. back in the first edition and stuff. You know, the the game system has evolved as our understanding of not being dicks to other people has evolved. Ah. Uh, but that seems to be something that like we're that kind of seems to be. Uh, I, I see that in conversation a lot in the different groups and uh, uh, that I'm in, just like online and stuff. And um, I know Pathfinder for their second edition. They still like they decided to divorce the strict stack bonuses and racial abilities a lot more from the individual races and make them more reflective of different cultures or being from different regions right, and stuff. Right. To go in general, you know, I just think that's uh, for one, it, it 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 takes a little bit of the you know blatant racism out of the game. Essentially, I mean, part of the stuff we're talking about is it's based upon racial stereotypes that have often real world analogies that yeah you know, we try to kind of shove aside and not think about when we're doing this kind of stuff. So, you know, obviously, you know, if you're talking about a winged elf, there's not probably a, a real-world analogy to that. But, right. um, you know, some of the other ones, you could certainly say that people were thinking of these things when they did this, right? You want yeah. to get into some literary analysis of it. So I think it's probably better that we don't try to stat that out and make that something that's ugly in that sense, right? Yeah. And I know, Ed, you, you've said a lot, like numerous times before, how you specifically avoided making things that were like, oh, well, this is just the Forgotten Realms version of X thing from the real world, among other things, to get away from those types of stereotypes and tropes that, that tend to come along with that. And I'm not even thinking about how Ed did it. I'm thinking even going back to Tolkien and such. And oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Free Tolkien, right? A lot of the roots of what we're talking about. This stuff was laid down long before any of us were doing this kind of stuff. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like Tolkien. And if I was trying to avoid real-world analogs, for the ease of getting going on the realms as a huge product line, and with TSR deliberately not wanting me to be the bottleneck that Gary was, unavoidably, <laughs> and that Margaret and Tracy became Dragonlance because of their lead design position with the novels, they would deliberately introduce real-world analogs and that was part of the original position paper that Jeff Grubb wrote, you know, a unified game world for the second edition of the game. We need to be able to slot in Oriental Adventures, which became Oriental Adventures. <laughs> Arabian Adventures, which became El Khadim. Um, Jungle Adventures, which became Malatra. Uh, Pirate Adventures, all this stuff. And so and you had Zeb Cook and Doug Niles both on staff as senior designers who were ex-history teachers, you know. And you have an ease when you're dealing with outside licenses of just saying, well, it's sort of like American Civil War, only blah, blah, blah. Or this is sort of like discovering the new world, blah, blah, blah. So you introduce a real world analog because it's really easy for designers to get going in a hurry on something where they can understand it. So that TSR was putting them in as fast as I was saying, no, 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 don't do that. And um, I was saying, no, 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 don't do that, just purely because if things are the, your own world that is different, then you keep your head in the game and your role playing. But if you take it to real world analogs and you've got a table of gamers, there's inevitably some rules lawyer who says, but stirrups weren't introduced until... <laughs> and and you get jolted right out of the game and the immersive experience of what the Dungeon Master is telling you about the world around into, okay, so let's metagame this. You know? <laughs> so that was my concern. I wasn't doing the, oh my goodness, uh, we aren't enlightened enough because I'm Canadian. I was already going, oh yeah, Americans <laughs> do everything different. And then when I would go down to the Midwest and I go, 
holy shit are these people repressed you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're right here Ed. <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah but you can't count wisconsin and minnesota they're pretty much just canadians anyway I, i've yeah. tried wisconsin pizza it's a crime <laughs> <laughs> has to be New York or Chicago. Come on. Well, uh, no, I don't. Chicago is a casserole. It's not a pizza. That's that's not a, yeah. I have, that's I have not. strong opinions on this. I was born in Jersey. It's it's genetic. Well, uh, as a Canadian, <laughs> I have to champion was... Hawaiian pizza. Oh <laughs> my God! There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. My wife is an Islander. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh. but but you know what what Matt was talking about earlier about the years of work in the in the video game industry or computer game industry and then it doesn't come out. The moment he said that, I was thinking all that cold pizza. Oh my <laughs> god! How many boxes of cold pizza stacked up in, in the offices of whatever company? <laughs> yeah. Go back to Spike's original question. I I do remember from races that the direction and the discussion was quite clear for the humans, there would be absolutely no racial bonuses. I know you're alluding to some of the yeah. other races as well. So we, what we did is we showed the cultural differences through feats, but we never did yeah. anything with, with uh, like, this race is stronger than that race, or this ethnic group is stronger than that ethnic group, or, you know, more charismatic or anything like that. There was never any intent to do that. I really liked the feat implementation for that, though. What I think third edition lacked at the time was like you had so few feats that it was hard to make those worthwhile or incentivized enough. Um, it's a, another thing that I like about Pat, that Pathfinder 2 has deliberately done is making everything feats. You get different types of feats, and you do get like racial feats, you get class feats, and you can get feats that you invest in cultural things that they have in their campaign guides that... Um, really allow you to add that flavor to the character and they're basically trying to say like this is all equal now so it's not that past like you know taking a uh amnish background as opposed to great cleave it was like well great cleave's gonna let me kill extra dudes <laughs> yeah. that's gonna get me a plus two bonus on you, you know uh pers or on uh, uh diplomacy sorry third third edition uh diplomacy checks yeah, you know it's just not it wasn't comparable but it was still like a really nice way to implement that and show the different like cultures because I think that's something that gets glossed over a lot with the Forgotten Realms, uh, it, is how diverse it is. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly, exactly. Well, there's a actually you have a question from George Crasho since he couldn't make it. Curry, you want to read that since that's all you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! Well, you have to do it in the accent, accent, right? That's right. You go to Disney. Curry, you better edit your previous notes so you know take the Jeff part out. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. we'll make sure we edit things just so all right so george's question is what parts of the unapproachable east oh, and geez. races of Farron did matt work on and what can be what can he tell us about the experience of writing in the realms oh i don't remember it's been so long <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's got to be like 18, 20 years, right? Uh, not quite that. Yeah, about 18 can, years. Can, can you name the different nations of the Unapproachable East still? Uh, I remember <laughs> working on Fate quite a lot. Uh, I, I tell you, here's the crazy part. Is I was actually late on a, Unapproachable East. It was the first time I was ever late on a book in my entire life. And I was literally sitting in a hospital uh, with my wife who was on bed rest with quadruplets in her, in her womb. When I called up Rich Baker and said, Rich, I'm going to be late. And he goes, why? I said, my wife's pregnant with quadruplets, and he just stopped. <laughs> yeah. Take all the time you need. Wow. Uh, so, That's an excuse. Okay. So that was several of those and, and just you know, crazy flashes in between running around. We already had a kid who was three years old at the time, and I was taking care of him while my wife was on bed rest. Um, and then you know, with the, with the quads, she was on bed rest for 10 weeks, drug up her eyeballs. And then they came in a big rush, obviously. And, you know, I didn't sleep for years and years and years. So, yeah, <laughs> think back to that time and ask me what I was doing. Changing diapers is pretty much the only thing I can tell you, right? Uh, I do remember Faye quite a bit. I remember on Races of Room working on the, the flying uh, people, the Aarakocra, is that right? Um, yes. Yep. Aarakocra and, uh, and the Averials. 
Yeah, Eric, Eric might remember better than I do. <laughs> really surprised um, they haven't brought them back for 5e, the Averials, because they're they were so popular, and you know they high, they had an Averial character in Baldur's Gate too. Yeah, well, I well I ended up putting them in one of my uh, Atlas Quest books. Actually, I decided, oh hey, we could use them there. So worked out fine. Oh, this is just an educated guess, but in sure. answer to Spike's last question, right now Wizards is trying to keep all of their releases in the Sword Coast. Right. Yeah. And once you have a winged race, they can fly anywhere. <laughs> and it'll well, start it'll start the why haven't you detailed this? Let's detail that. Let's and one of the reasons to staying in the Sword Coast is so that you can let outside licensees use other parts of the realms and have a freer sure. hand. Yeah. So, but they did introduce the Aarakocra. They did that with Temple of Elemental Evil reboot that they right. did, the Princess of the Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. But and though I guess like those get picked, you see them showing up a lot in the popular D- like you know D D streams and and some of the the published stuff. I guess they are they're still that's still like kind of it's not in the PHP. You know, it's not yes. Star Coast Adventures yeah. guide. It's in the the supplemental you know book. Yep, and therefore it discourages wholesale aerial voyages. <laughs> Fly the friendly skies, you know. Yeah, and, you know they're well, not doing source books like that anymore, right? They do large scale adventures. I think they've yeah. had a source book out since the main stuff came out. It was the Sword Coast Adventures guy, right? Right. Everything yeah. Else, right. And you know this this campaign, that campaign, and, and things are tied into that. But not, you know they're not developing different sections of the world explicitly for people to set things in. You can go and you know rob those things blind for your own campaigns. But uh, it's definitely you have your own track you're supposed to be on on the official one. Yeah, yeah, there's there's been a very much a dearth of information about what's going on beyond what's immediately relevant to the campaigns that they've released and uh, and even those it's usually very very bespoke uh, what they're putting in there. You know, the stuff in Waterdeep Dragon Heist like you get a uh, was it Enkai Volo's Enkai reading of Waterdeep which was cool to see, but you know, I, I could cover my garage door wall with the maps of Waterdeep that I have. And, <laughs> right. Uh, I partially have, uh, you know. Because they multiple... should. Yeah. They should. What do you mean, have? You should. You should <laughs> I, don't, I have the entire Savage Frontier and, like, Waterdeep in the North maps up there right now. So that I, I put little post-it notes for my players to track where stuff has happened. Because I've got five campaigns all interlocked. So they have to... That's yeah. how you can see the spider web. Right, right, right. No, it's, that's awesome. And uh, Eric, did you have a question for Matt too? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to say. Um, so, when you did it on Approachable East, there wasn't that much realms lore around. Uh, there was like the old um, FR6 Dream of the Red Wizards, and there right. was FR9 the Bloodstone Lands. Do you like working where you have? A little bit already in place and you're building on that or do you prefer to have a little bit more of an empty corner where you're putting your own stamp well you know i i, I could go either way depending on what the assignment uh requires but i do like having a little bit extra space right i like to be able to take i don't like to do stuff on a whole cloth when i'm writing work for fire for somebody else where i'm coming up you know taking my best ideas and putting them into the world i like to riff off what's already there but i like to have some room to riff i like some elbow room to be able to come up with crazy ideas but these are generally speaking i don't feel bad about putting my craziest ideas that i'm riffing on into those things because i wouldn't have had those ideas if i wasn't working with that original material right mm-hmm. i wouldn't I, I wouldn't come up with this crazy shit if it wasn't for this other crazy shit that i'm working off of, right right um, and it must be nice to be able to do that though without having to make sure that whatever you're creating has to mesh with somebody else's and somebody else's lore they've already put in the area or close by. So you can just say, you know what, this is mine. I'm going to do it here and let them worry about it. Yeah. I I think the guys at wizards and at uh, TSR before that, they tended to uh, let the stuff that would be tightly meshed (coughs) in the house, right? Because they could go over the next cubicle and say, what do you think about this? Or what do you want about that? But especially back before we had proper internet for a lot of this stuff and, you know, slacks and, and uh, base camps and all this kind of crap. It was hard for somebody to communicate. I couldn't just say, ping somebody and expect an answer within minutes, with you know, even days, if I had a particular question about it. So, for instance, when I wrote uh, my Eberron novels way back in the day, they're like, we're going to let you do it in this one section because we haven't developed that. Don't plan on being developing this for years. So go ahead and write whatever you want to for this, right? Uh, and it's nice to have that kind of a freedom where you could say, at least I'm not stepping on somebody else's toes. Because I've had the opposite experience when I was working on... Uh, 
Go, I was working on a Guild Wars novel uh, called Ghosts of Ascalon, and Jeff Grubb ended up being my co-author in that because Jeff was the war master over there at ArenaNet at the time. But that was a game that had been in development for three years and still had another two years to go but while I was working on the book. And, you know, it didn't matter where I tried to avoid stuff. I was stepping on people's toes constantly, right? I would have an approved outline. Everything would be done. And they'd say, no, I'm sorry, we moved this city over here. So this road trip that you're doing, this road novel, suddenly doesn't make any sense, right? And I, it, I often say it was like trying to shoot a moving target, but it was worse. It was trying to shoot an exploding target going in several different directions. And <laughs> oh, wow. Right? Yeah. And eventually they said, you're right, you can't possibly do this. So they gave it to Jeff to do the final draft with. And I did a little bit of polishing after that for Tone, just to make sure it meshed up with my, my original stuff. But um, Because Jeff's a great writer. I just wanted to make sure it all sounded like it was one voice. But uh, even then, Jeff was made mistakes that he couldn't correct, even though he was one of the guys writing the stuff in the office at the time, just because it was changing too quickly. And, you know, honestly, when you're working on something like that, the computer game or the tabletop game or whatever, that is the dog, and you can't let the tail wag the dog. You can't let the novel be the thing that dictates what's going to happen in the game. So the game has to have precedence, um, but it made it very painful to write these things. And I try not to write for games that are in development if I have a choice in them. Right. Um, although I just did that with the Minecraft Dungeons game, uh, novel. So. Yeah, I want to go over that, too, with, with the Minecraft. I'm waiting to get back from them about that right well, now. But, but before we get to Minecraft, is there, like, with all that in consideration, since you did work on Unapproachable East, is there anything you would like to say about Impilter in particular that directly <laughs> contradicts anything George has written? <laughs> oh, <laughs> stir it up. <laughs> Just stir it up. Oh, okay, wait a second. Wait, yeah, wait, wait, wait the end up here. George, we did not ask him to do this. <laughs> no, no, I want to know, tell us the truth. All the monarchs are really goblins, right? <laughs> Damn it, Eric. You have to have some secrets, okay? Oh, my God. George is going to gonna complots on this. I don't know. <laughs> And Ed didn't contradict that, so it must be true. <laughs> Ed's not talking. He's just smiling and shaking his head. Cheshire grin over there. I, 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 I'm waiting to see what Matt does. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Matt has been postulated about in Pultor, so what can you tell us? Oh, God, I don't... I don't I, nothing, nothing. Can't nothing? Tell you okay. okay. <laughs> they're, they're all doppelgangers. Yeah. They're all doppelgangers. So tell us something that we'll just give to George and say, George, Matt said this and it's canon now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I can detect a trap when I hear one. <laughs> uh, roll a 20 sided dice. Exactly. <laughs> well, tell me about the Minecraft because I was I didn't know that there were Minecraft novels. Now, my son uh, started playing this. I remember walking in one day and I said, What the hell are you doing playing an 8 bit eight <laughs> game? So it looks ugly, right? It's he's ugly. ugly. And he's looking and he's playing. He goes, oh, this is the greatest game invented. And, and, I, and I said, okay, I'll download it and play it. Before I knew it, I had a whole mansion built. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's addictive. And I'm like, this is addictive. I built a glass mansion on the side of a mountain. And I'm like, this is the most beautiful game I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and so what? I mean, did they approach you? Did you ask them? Or... They approached me. They uh, Just out of the blue, actually. Well, kind of out of the blue. Here's a funny thing. If you end up doing this stuff long enough, people ask you to do stuff, right? And, right, right. Uh, <laughs> and I haven't actually had to go out and look for work for many years now. People just show up with things and say, are you interested in this? And then I have to decide whether or not I have the time or the interest or whatever. But uh, for this one, uh, I had met a couple of editors at Del Rey over the summer. Um, uh, one at, at Comic-Con and then one at Gen Con. And the guy came up to me at Gen Con, uh, Tom, um, was actually, he said, you know what, one of the first fantasy novels I ever read were your uh, Eberron series of novels. And I just loved him when I was 15. And now he's hiring people to write books at Del Rey. Right? Wow. <laughs> oh, that's convenient for me, I guess. You know, and, uh, uh, and this obviously, I'm not even working with him on this one. I'm working with a guy named Alex Davis. Uh, uh, they... I'm sure what happens, it's the same thing that happened when I got the, the Star Wars novel, which, again, they just called me out of the blue, or, you know, emailed me out of the blue. Um, they look at it and say, okay, who do we know that does, can do middle grade fiction and can do video games and uh, uh, can do fantasy or whatever? That's how I ended up with Minecraft. With uh, the Star Wars one, they needed somebody who could do military science fiction and write it for uh, as a middle grade book or a YA book. And right. there just aren't that many people that leap to mind immediately. When and Troy Denning wasn't available. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so they're like, okay, we'll we'll pick Matt out of a hat and do this. So, uh, you know, I talked to these guys over the summer and you know said, and they go, well, we should work on something. I'm like, yeah, sure, when whatever, you know, whenever it happens. And then I got an email saying, are you interested in working on the new Minecraft uh, novel? I said, yeah, of course. Um, and also, you know, to cross it over again back to Sweden, which we were talking about earlier, um, I uh, uh, I was in Sweden at a convention in May in northern Sweden, like 20 miles south of the Arctic Circle, and uh, a bunch of the Mojang guys, were pe- uh, the company that did Minecraft that was purchased by Microsoft, a bunch of the Mojang people were up there, and I was out drinking with them. We hit it off. We had a great time. Right. And I'm sure that didn't hurt me at all either, just the fact that uh, they knew me and knew I'd be somebody that they could chat with about this kind of stuff. So, uh, the funny part is, you know, there's not much of a story in Minecraft, as you know. Right? No, you there, well, there is no storyline at all. You just exactly. create your own. You're just building shit and, and watching it be torn down by zombies and exploding plants or whatever those things are. Exactly. But in uh, Minecraft Dungeons, is actually kind of taking Minecraft and crossing it with Diablo or, uh, uh, you know, any of those, like, Baldur's Gate games, any of those old... Uh, uh, isometric adventure games, mm-hmm. right? But all the levels are procedurally generated, just like everything is in Minecraft. So everything's going to be different every time you play it, right? Which means that there can't be a plot, really. I mean, there's a very loose bits of a plot that are told in cutscenes, but the rest of it is just make it up, or you're telling your own story, creating your own thing as you go. So I had to come up with something that didn't affect any of that stuff. That was So basically, I ended up writing a prequel <laughs> that tells about the rise of the main villain in the game, and how he becomes that villain. And right. so it's called the rise of the arch illager because the bad guys are not villagers, they're illagers. I mean, <laughs> so that's how, that's how it was given, given to me. But um, so the arch illager is the, the head bad dude. And uh, I, I uh, detail how he gets from the point of being this little bully runt to becoming the most powerful of the illagers who's taking over the entire world that the heroes have to stop. And that was you know, great fun. It was about 70,000 words and uh, you know, I wrote it in about two months and had a ball with it, so, uh, based upon an outline that I, I pitched these guys. So it's a great game. My kids adore Minecraft. I'm actually really I've played it a number of times myself, and I'm looking forward to playing Minecraft Dungeons when it comes out too. Which hopefully would be I guess it's supposed to come out in April, and then the novel comes out in July. You know, it's really it's, funny when I played it. I always did the dungeon. I always dug. I immediately started digging straight yeah, of down. Course. <laughs> That's because you're a dwarf, Jeff. I know. I just finished the novel last week, I guess. Last Thursday, right? So a week ago from yesterday. And the book is coming out in July. So there's not a whole lot of time in between. (laughs) I turned it in a week early and and I was like, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Will you plan to write more for them, I hope? Uh, We'll see. I mean, hopefully. I mean, you never know. Sometimes you work on this and then the editor's on to the next thing with the next person. And you never hear back from them again. And if I uh, have time and I'm and I'm anxious about, I'll knock on their door and say, "Hey, can we do some more stuff?" But often I'm on to the next thing. I've got uh, lots and lots of other irons in the fire. You know, if they want to come back to me, I'd say sure. You know, I had a great experience doing it. Uh, it's like doing the Halo novels. If and when they want to come back to me to do more of them, I'd probably do more. But it really depend on what my schedule looks like at that time and what other things I happen to be doing. Now, when you play the when you write these novels, and like for example, Halo, I played yeah. Halo maybe an hour's worth. My son was into it at the time. Um, but uh, did you play the game to get a taste of what it's like in the world before you write something about it? Well, the benefit for me on Halo is I loved Halo before that. Right? Oh, really? Nice. Okay. So, yeah, well, I actually got to a point right around 2013 or so, 2014, where I'm like, yeah, screw it, I'm never writing another tie-in novel again. I, I've got too much of my own stuff I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And then people are like, well, what about this Star Wars book? You're like, oh, sh- yeah, Star Wars, you know? <laughs> Halo. Like, oh, God, yeah, Halo, okay, fine. You know, would, you, would you like to write the Marvel Encyclopedia? Oh, sh- <laughs> uh, so it wasn't like twist like, my rubber oh, arm it's a really, really good problem to have right but uh, in a sense it's still a problem because I still want to get back to my own stuff I have a novel that's overdue for tour now for I sold it to them in 2012 right? oh, wow. I still haven't turned it in uh, and part of the reason was my editor got fired for sexual harassment and then they moved me over to another editor and she's like I don't have time for this right now and I'm like oh that's great because I'm going to be really really late and uh, now I'm later than any of us thought we were going to be, but I got my, I, we had some health issues and my dad got sick. My mom passed away. Got crazy here for a few years. It's much stabilized now. And I, at one point I was six novels behind on my schedule. Now I'm down to one novel behind. So I'm catching up. Yep. Just one more I know how that feels. <laughs> oh, sure you do. <laughs> 
you know, I'm looking funny, back here. Funny so story. Oh, go ahead. I turn, I turned down. Uh, Tom Doherty asked Brian Thompson when they first got the rights to do Halo novels. Ah. And and he said, "Hey, can you have Ed write a Halo novel?" And I had to gently explain, not all gamers play all games. <laughs> right. And yeah. I don't have an IBM computer. I only have the Mac they bought me. Halo doesn't run on Macs, or didn't then. So I'll write you one, but I'm I'm starting from ground zero. Well, you you should a marathon. You gotta hold out you for should, next month, baby. <laughs> you you should get a fan of the game to write this thing rather than a complete neophyte. And Tom said, "Yeah, that that's a very good point. Thanks for being so honest." And I said, "Because ah, I was like, <laughs> I'm already I'm already four novels behind, and I have to stop everything and learn Halo and buy a computer to run it. <laughs> no, thank you." So, <laughs> and then of course, what did they do? Publish Fall of Reach. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Crazy did well for him, but like for I I had been playing Halo for years. I actually. Uh, when I when I first moved back to Wisconsin, I went down to Chicago where Bungie's offices were at the time, and interviewed with them for working on another game. I think it was Myth, um, and it ended up going to John Scott Tynes instead, who then went on to he did Puppet Land and a whole bunch of other great stuff. And he's now at Wizards of the Coast after having spent many years at Microsoft working on various things. So I yeah, you know, if I was going to lose out on a gig, losing out to John's a good thing. But um, when I was there, they showed me a tech demo of Halo like two years before it came out before they'd actually been purchased by Microsoft. So I get to see it, you know, a couple years before anybody else did. I really, I was just stunned by it then. And when it came out and I had an Xbox, I played it. It's actually the first first person shooter I play with all my kids. Because oh, really? it's a game that has a uh, couch. A lot of the games except for Halo 5, the most recent one, have co ops. You can sit next to somebody with split screen and play it with them. And you know, for a first person shooter, it's fairly tame in the sense that like you're shooting aliens and they spur, you know, glowing purple blood and all this kind of stuff. So it's a great game to introduce kids to this kind of stuff without saying, okay, now we're going to go shoot people, right? Yeah. It's not like Call of Duty or something like this. Or, <laughs> yeah. Like now we're going to go murder people from other cultures or whatever. No, it's like, oh, the aliens are attacking. We need to kill, you know, or the, the zombies are attacking. Like, okay, great. So so for me, I, I by the time I actually sat down and read a Halo novel, I had probably played every game in the line twice, right? Oh, wow. But, um, and it was a lot of fun. Plus... My uh, two of the novels I wrote for them were sequels to Halo 3 ODST, which had uh, half the cast of Firefly Ooh, was yeah. uh, voices for it. And Nathan Fillion was the guy who did the voice for Buck, who's the main yes, character. Yes, that's right. And so I ended up having Nathan's voice running around the back of my head for like six months, which is not a terrible thing, really, right? He's, no, he's no. got a great banterous mm-hmm. way about him, and it's a lot of fun. So I really got a kick out of it. I really enjoyed it a tremendous amount. Well, we hope you enjoyed uh, that first hour of the interview with Matt Forbeck. Join us again next time, episode 21, where we'll continue this interview and finish it up. And until then, keep playing in the realms. Mm-hmm.